everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join our webinar. Today, uh, we're introducing the single step CO2 response to the SCORE method. Dr. Bunce will demonstrate how quick and easy it is to perform rapid measurement of ACI on C3 and C4 species using the SCORE method with his Cyrus 4 portable photosynthesis system. Just a bit about Dr. Bunce. He has a, uh, over 40 years of experience uh, with the USDA Agricultural Research Service in Beltsville, Maryland, as an environmental plant physiologist. Uh, his focus has been on photosynthesis, stomatal conductance, and plant water relations, and their response and acclimation in the context of plant adaptation to the environment. A most recently, adaptation to the global change factors of rising carbon dioxide concentration and temperature. Uh, before we begin, please keep your microphones on mute throughout the presentation. If you have any questions, please be sure they're relevant to the presentation and place them in the chat. We'll do our very best to answer each question. Uh, if for some reason we cannot, we'll email you a response uh, to your question within a day or so. So without further ado, Dr. Bunce, we'll take it from here. Thank you, Carrie. Um, so as she said, uh, we're gonna talk about the single step CO2 response method, um, but I'd first like to, uh, review just very briefly, um, CO2 ramping, um, high speed uh, CO2 ramping, uh, which um, we began with the Cyrus-3. Um, and it has allowed users to be able to rapidly measure ACI curves. Um, and with a, with a, now with the Cyrus-4, the process is is much easier to program and record. You no, no longer need to use a response script as the, the ramping function is, is uh, much more accessible. So it's, e it's even faster and easier. Um, so the high-speed ramping, um, there's several steps. Um, first uh, step was to perform a stored differential balance calibration. And this uh, is important in letting the instrument uh, know at each step in CO2 what the instrument sensitivity is, uh, that the differential balance calibration changes with background CO2. So this uh, collects that information and stores it uh, to adjust the CO2 uh, flux based on the background CO2. Um, you need to set your zero in differential balance mode. You set the criteria for ramping and the recording options. Uh, you perform a, a, a ramp with an empty chamber. And uh, why we need to do that, we'll get into in a minute. Uh, then you put a leaf in the chamber and run the same ramp. Um, you transfer your data files to a PC and you begin post-processing. The post-processing really is taking the CO2 differential at every step during the ramp, and uh, just put that in a in a file in the in the in the Excel sheet that has the the actual ramp with a leaf in it, and you basically subtract two columns, and that gives you the actual assimilation rate, and then you need to recalculate the substomatal CO2 constant, the CI value, based on the corrected assimilation rate. Um, so it, you can do a complete ramp uh, in roughly five minutes for both C3 and C4 species. Um, and it uses the, the normal configuration of the sample reference, uh, reference sample tube. Um, so it requires running an empty chamber ramp at the same ramp speed and, CO, and same CO2 range that you're going to use in your measurement. And as I said, the CO2 differential of the empty chamber at each step is subtracted from values for leaf. And uh, so and so just in Excel, you can do a simple post-processing to recalculate uh, corrected values of A and CI to generate your ACI curve. Now the empty chamber ramps are actually fairly stable over time uh, for you know, if you do one, you can use it for, for a few days of measurements, and they are actually independent of the, the chamber temperature. So you don't have to worry about that. You could run different temperatures using and use the same empty chamber ramp data for, for corrections. So um, this has been 
we've been doing these for a while. Um, and you get the same results you would do, you would get with a steady state curve. Steady state curves, as many of you probably know, often take 20 to 30 minutes per leaf compared to roughly five minutes for, for running the CO2 ramping. Uh, the rate that, at which you change CO2, the ramping speed, somewhere between 100 and 220 parts per million, that's the range we've sort of looked at. Um, and within that range, um, the, the ramping speed does not affect the resulting ACI curves. So it's fairly flexible as to the speed of CO2 change. And ramping up and ramping down in CO2 both produce the same results. And I'll talk later about the uh, advantages of, of each going up and going down. So we'll talk about that later. Um, and it works very well. It has been available for several years with the Cyrus 3, uh, now with the Cyrus 4, and has been accepted in literature, uh, first published in 2018, but several times since. So uh, the new one, single step CO2 response, SSCO2R. Um, what it does, as you can see on this animation, it's showing an actual assimilation rate versus CI plot uh, collected in real time. So uh, not quite that fast in reality, but exactly that kind of data set, you can generate an ACI curve um, in a single step um, very quickly. No post-processing is needed. And it just generates an A versus CI curve. Started at the bottom, you have to discard the first little bit of data. Um, so the high-speed CO2 ramping technique, um, the differential in CO2 between it, during ramping an empty chamber is caused by the lag time between the sample and reference lines due to the volume of the leaf chamber and the gas lines leading to and from it. So what we've come out, and so this differential must be corrected in post-processing the data. What we've done with a, with a single step method is to eliminate that lag time. So the reference and analysis channels now have identical time responses during a CO2 ramp, which means that the differential of CO2 during an empty ramp would be zero. So there's no need to, to enter that information. You just um, accept the values of A and CI uh, directly. So it's the uh, fastest, most accurate, and streamlined method available for the rapid measurement of A versus CI curves. It eliminates the need for empty chamber ramps and eliminates the need for any data post-processing. And it generates an ACI curve directly in real time. So how do we do it? There are two options. One is to to correct to uh, change the the time difference between uh, sampling of CO two sample and CO two reference. One way is to add additional tubing to the reference line. And the amount of tubing that you add, it just depends on the flow rate that you're going to use through the leaf chamber. Uh, or on the second method, um, which actually is a whole lot easier, is to utilize the ramp path equalizer. It's a little uh, syringe gadget with a couple of tubes on it. And it's easy to adjust the volume uh, for, for any flow rate you want for, for the leaf cubette simply by moving this, the plunger of the syringe. And we'll show you that in a minute. So the long reference tube, we replace that short little junction tube with a longer piece of tubing. And it effectively matches the path length of the uh, sample tube uh, and, the, and the reference tube to give you a uh, zero difference. Um, so the length of tubing is depends on the, uh, the flow rate you're gonna use. So this is just sort of a, a plot or a graph table, excuse me, of cuvette flow rates, and then uh, how much length of eighth inch tubing you would need to get um, zero differential for an empty uh, chamber. So 
Is my reference tube incorrect? Correct. Um, you run a test, uh, you, you pick a length of tubing and to see if it's correct, uh, you close up your cuvette and you just test to see whether that uh, differential is zero as you begin to ramp. If it's slightly positive, you have to shorten the tubing. If it's slightly negative, you need a little bit longer tubing. Alternatively, which is actually much easier, is once you make a good guess as to the length of tubing, uh, don't bother changing the length of the tubing, just change the cuvette flow rate a little bit until the differential is zero. That's that's uh, a much quicker and easier way to do that. Make, make, make a good guess about the length of tubing you need and then do little tiny adjustments just with the cuvette flow rate until you get that differential to be zero. So this is just a picture of the uh, simple little uh, uh, ramp path equalizer, which is just a, uh, uh, syringe with a couple pieces of tubing. Um, and this is, this is the model number if you're looking for one on the uh, PP uh, site. Uh, so you just adjust with a plunger, you just adjust the volume uh, during an empty chamber test in order to see to achieve a zero CO2 differential. And very quick and easy. And there it is plugged into the, uh, again, the same to analyze air out and air reference air in is, is where it gets connected. And then you just move the plunger in and out until you get zero differential. And the, uh, what, the, uh, what determines the, the setting of that uh, syringe is the chamber flow rate. So you just adjust the plunger until the CO2 differential is zero during an empty chamber test. And um, this is true both for the plunger position and for the length of tubing. They're dependent on the chamber flow rate and not dependent at all on the direction or the speed of the CO2 ramping. So once you have, once you've decided on a flow rate, that's all you need to know. And, and you do your adjustment and you're all set no matter which way you've you want to do the ramp or how fast you want to do the ramp. So the process comparison, the, high, the original high-speed CO2 ramping, you need to do an empty chamber ramp. You do a ramp with a leaf, you transfer data files, and you do the post-processing to recalculate assimilation rate and CI. With a sing, single step method, you put you do a ramp with your leaf, and then your data shows up in your data file. Your ACI curve uh, ready made. So um, we get this question occasionally: um, Is it better to ramp up or down? The assimilation rate versus CI curve you're going to get is the same. Um, going to produce the same results. So it's really a matter of what's convenient. And just uh, sort of a, for me, for C3 species, um, the CO2 level that you need to reach to get a, a plateau of assimilation rate is quite variable among different species and especially at different temperatures. And for that reason, to me, it is more convenient to ramp up in direction and to just stop the ramp whenever the plateau is reached. So if it plateaus early, you, you, your total ramp time then is, is much reduced. Um, so you just watch the data come in, see when it flattens out, and then just stop your ramp. So for C3 species, because of how high you need to go to get a plateau is quite variable, it, it just makes sense to me um, to do the ramp from the bottom toward the top, so ramping up. For C4 species, on the other hand, the CO2 saturation is, is much more predictable than it is for C3s. So you have a pretty good idea of what's gonna be saturating. So you just start there and go down. Um, and if the advantage uh, for C4s is that ramping down provides more data at the low CO2 end, which is uh, important for analyzing the data for, CO, for C4 uh, assimilation rate curves. So those are just suggestions. You can actually do whatever you want. Um, 
And again, the data agree with steady state ACI data. And this just, I did this one afternoon a week ago, uh, outdoors in my garden. And um, just the simulation rate versus CI. And I did the, uh, this, the single step CO2 re response method is the uh, little, the cloud of little blue dots and the green dots are steady state. And you can see the various as well as you can expect. So uh, very nice smooth curves um, and they agree with each other as well as they could possibly agree. Um, so curve, it took about uh, five minutes versus the steady state curve data points that I collected here, which is one, two, three, I think it's eight of them, something like that, seven or eight, took about 25 minutes for this species. Uh, this was done at leaf temperature of 22, uh, PPFD of 1500, and a VPD of 100, of 1.0, and a flow rate of uh, 350. So that, um, so again, it took five minutes to get all these, this blue cloud of data and took 25 minutes to get the green data points. Okay, a lot quicker. So these were both done outdoors. Um, and using the universal leaf cuvette with the 18 millimeter diameter uh, circular window. So um, people should realize that three C3s and C4s give you very different curves. So your ramping uh, is gonna be quite different. And this is just a, sort of a random example. Um, parsley, which is the blue here, so C3. Typical C3 comes up here and saturates somewhere 800 to, you know, it flattens out pretty well by 800. C4 is really steep initially, flattened out by, by the time you get to 200, you're pretty much done for CI values. Um, so, uh, you're, you, the, the ideal ramp for those is going to depend on whether you're dealing with a C3 or a C4. So what, what uh, PPFD do you use? Um, sort of depends on the purpose of why you're doing these. Um, if you're going to try and apply a, a model of photosynthesis to your data, um, the models are basically designed to work at saturating PPFD. So, um, and certainly PPFD is going to affect the shape of the curve. And this is just an example of that for a, a weed um, run at the low PPFD, which I think was about 400 micromoles per meter squared per second. You can see that you get a much, uh, the slope, initial slope is much shallower and the plateau is much shallower, but the plateau doesn't happen until you get out further than it does at high PFD, PPFD. So higher PPFD, much steeper initial slope, and it tends to flatten out uh, earlier on in terms of CO2, CI. Uh, so, um, but if you're gonna use it, uh, try and put your data into a model. Uh, the models are basically going to assume that your PPFD is saturated. So unless you have a specific reason for doing it lower PPFD, um, go ahead and run the light up. So what temperature? Um, again, temperature does make a difference. This is uh, just uh, dandelions measured at uh, two temperatures, 30 and 20. Um, and you can see it, it changes the initial slope substantially, changes the plateau, changes both of them. Uh, and that's only a 10 degree difference. And that's a, that's a really big change in, in maximum and slopes. So temperature makes, makes a big difference. Um, so you have to pick it. Um, so what temperature? Um, for uh, Rubisco and for carboxylase, which are, are pretty much in control of the initial slopes of the ACI curves, there are uh, literature values for fairly standard temperature dependencies for those enzymes. Um, those, those values exist in literature. Um, so in that sense, um, you can, could measure at whatever temperature is convenient to you and use the models to 
extrapolate to any temperature you want. And that's, that's putting your trust in the models. Um, there's much less consensus um, about the temperature dependence of the plateau values. Um, the literature's kind of um, got lots of different options for that. So there's no real rule of thumb about uh, how that plateau value is going to change with temperature. Um, so in that sense, uh, you're better off doing the measurements at the temperature you're interested in, uh, whatever that is. Um, and even um, the standard uh, photosynthesis models, uh, there's some newer research out there that says that there's considerable variation in the temperature dependencies of both Rubisco and pepcarboxylase. So I wouldn't put a whole lot of faith in these uh, these models, um, model values for the temperature dependency of the initial slope. If you really care about that, it's something that you need to find out for yourself for your plant grown the way it's grown. Um, so uh, the answer of what temperature to use uh, depends on the purpose of why you're doing the ACI curves. Um, whether you trust models to give you the temperature dependency or you want to get a real value for yourself. Um, and that's all I'm going to say. Um, this new method makes going to make a life a whole lot easier, and it should have been discovered a long time ago, but it, <laughs> it's, it's here now, and let's use it. Uh, it works really great, um, and I'll open it up for questions. Well, we know you're, well, a, big we know you're a big fan. big <laughs> fan. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's ask some questions here. Um, I have one. Um, says, what about VPD variation for the score method? Uh, do we need to alter a sample analyzer flow rate while changing the system flow rate? What about VPD? Um, these curves are done, um, the whole thing is done in about five minutes. So uh, for C3s at least, um, that's pretty much faster than Stomatal conductance is going to change with CO2 concentration. So um, you pick a, pick a value, and then as you run the curve, the VPD effect um, is, well, you, you need to stabilize your plant um, initially, or either use the ambient value or just pick your own value and impose it on the plant until it adjusts to it. But during the ramping, it's not the ramping is going to have happened fast enough that stomatal conductance is not going to change um, because the, that response is is slower than than uh, five minutes um, for mo for 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 all the C threes that I've looked at. Um, you don't have to worry about that changing. Um, C fours are are the response can be a little faster, but um, I've never had that interfere. I've never had uh, smell conductance change during the ramping um, enough that uh, I worried about the calculation of CI. I think things uh, things are slow enough. Uh, the ramping happens fast enough relative to the change in stomatal conductance that that's not really an issue. Now, uh, that's not to say that VPD doesn't affect metal conductance because it does. Um, so you need to decide where you want to be um, because that will affect your plant. Um, but during the ramp, um, the ramp happens fast enough that that VP that smell conductance basically doesn't change uh, from where it was initially. Okay. Do you think um, you can stop sharing your screen so that people can see you? <laughs> um I I've lost track of the second half of that question. Uh uh, do we need to alter sample analyzer flow rate while changing the system flow rate? No, um, I never mess with the uh, analysis and reference uh, flows. Um, those are something I almost virtually never alter. They, I think they're set at 200. Um, and I just bother uh, changing them. So yeah, change your cuvette flow rate, but not not the sample reference flow rate. Okay. 
Uh, we have another, uh, when utilizing the ramp path equalizer and you say run the empty chamber test, do you mean run a ramp or just check the CO2D of the empty chamber once it's stabilized? You're actually, you, you initialize a ramp, um, and, but you're not gonna, you're not gonna wait for it to get to completion. You just run it long enough to see, so you can see whether the CO differential is zeroing out and then you quit. So it's you not process the data. It, it's the same process as running an empty chamber ramp, but you don't bother letting it go to completion or anything. You just run it long enough to get your CO2 differential to be zero and then you quit. So okay. um, if we don't have any more questions, um, I think that's about it. Okay. So thank you, Jim, for doing this. Okay. We know you're a big fan of it. You were the person to definitely present it. <laughs> You've done a few of these. <laughs> but um, and for everyone else, we'll get the webinar up on the website and um, and we'll send a link to everybody who signed up. And if you have any additional questions that come up later, feel free to send them to me and I'll make sure they get addressed either by someone here or by Jim directly. So I think we're all set. All right. Very good. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Contact us today to schedule a virtual demonstration of the Cyrus 4 portable photosynthesis system. Visit ppsystems.com.